गुड इवनिंग गायस आई एम डॉक्टर मुकुल मोहिंद्रा योर ऑर्थोपेडिक इंस्ट्रक्टर हेयर एट आन अकेडमी सो कैन आई जस्ट हैव यू थम दैट्स आप टू लेट मी नो दैट द ऑडियोविजुअल पार्ट इज ओके गुड इवनिंग राकेश आई होप द ऑडियोविजुअल पार्ट एंड एवरीथिंग इज ओके सो यू गैस कैन हेयर मी यू गैस कैन सी मी प्ली प्लीज जस्ट लेट मी नो यू नो मे बी से हेलो इन दी चैट बॉक्स और जस्ट गिव अ थम्स अप सो दैट यू नो I am aware that you guys are in, and I can just quickly begin, and we can discuss something sensible today. Uh, good evening, Rakesh. Is the audio visual okay? Okay. So fair enough, fair enough. All right. So I think we can just get going for the session today. So what I've kept in the book for you today is the orthopedic emergency room scenarios. It's been you know one of the favorite approach for the examiners to test your emergency skills. so what i've observed that lot of questions they are coming today from this particular zone you know the emergency treatment in orthopedic injuries so i would like to discuss some similar scenarios we would like you guys to develop an approach to handle the people who are a part of an orthopedic emergency like let's give an example now there is a fracture shown over here and perhaps you can see the bone coming out of the wound so you can fairly make it out that what you are dealing with is basically an open fracture now you have to pick up the relevant treatment option out of the following choices for this particular injury now this is the femur bone lower femur that is fractured okay and that's the part of the bone protruding out so you have to let me know what would be the ideal option should you be going with an external fixation or no internal fixation no go with kvr fixation or put in an antibiotic loaded impregnated nail yes so so people who are watching can i just ask you guys to submit some answers okay now this is an open fracture the bone is coming out of the wound okay the pulses and everything they are all palpable all okay so that means you can just focus on managing the fracture here so what kind of fixation would be ideal is what i want you guys to help me out with right so first of all this term internal fixation this basically refers to any metal that will be placed inside the skin to fix a fracture and that's why the name internal fixation like i'll give you an example a nail a plate maybe a wire maybe a screw so any metal that is placed inside the skin to fix a fracture is what comes under internal fixation in fact k wire fixation or this nailing they are just types of internal fixation so here what you actually need to do is not internal fixation that's all contraindicated in open fractures the answer here would actually be external fixation so sagar you are absolutely right the answer would be external fixation but let me just you know guide you a little about you know dealing with these open fractures in a more effective way a precise way i would say actually open fractures are first classified as per a very very popular classification system that's called a gustillo anderson classification now if you go by this classification system open fractures are divided into three categories now what you find in category 1 that there would be a puncture wound a wound where the size will be less than 1 cm like maybe you can pick it up here now when you go to the category type 2 the wound size will increase and you know it will be somewhere between 1 to 10 cm but when you go to the category 3 the wound size certainly crosses 10 cm clear enough okay now category 3 further gets divided into 3a 3b and 3c 
In 3C, you straight away find a neurovascular injury in addition to an open fracture because this is basically a classification for open fractures. Gaskillo Anderson. So, 3C, you will additionally find a neurovascular injury. Now, the difference between 3A and 3B. In 3A, you will find some soft tissue covering the bone. So, bone is not visible. The near most covering on the bone tends to be periosteum. So, you will at least find the periosteum to be intact. So, the bone cannot be seen. So, it is not visible here in type 2B. It is 2A, sorry. When you go to 3B, the bone becomes visible because now even the periosteal covering is gone. So that's what you classically find in type B that even the periosteum is disrupted so you can see the bone. If I just take you back here, I hope you can see the bone very clearly coming out of the bone. So even the periosteum is disrupted. So this will be taken as grade 3B. Clear with this classification? So it's a puncture wound that will be grade 1, 1 to 10 centimeters of wound that will be grade 2, more than 10 centimeters will be grade 3. There is a neurovascular injury, like here the pulses were palpable, so it's not grade 3C. Bone is visible, 3B, bone is not visible, 3. The whole idea behind this classification is basically to guide you on the treatment path. See the logic is very very simple, very very simple grade 1 and maybe up to grade 2 you could think about internal fixation maybe but the moment you go to these grades 3 here it is always and always external fixation grade 3 a b or c the problem internal fixation if you do it in open fractures there is an exceedingly high chances of fracture, of infection, sorry. See, in internal fixation, you have metals that are placed inside the skin. The metals are lacking a vascularity. So, neither can antibodies nor can antibiotics reach these metals. So, if these metals get infected, you cannot eliminate the infection. And open fractures, you have a communication with the environment. So, there is a tendency for the infection to settle on these metals. So we keep most of the metal outside the skin in open fracture. So we go with external fixation, particularly if it's a grade 3 open fracture. Grade 1 you can treat with internal fixation. Grade 2 is surgeon's choice. But grade 3, the rule of law, external fixation. So are you guys clear with this principle? Managing open fractures? And let me tell you, even though external fixation is always done, even a bigger priority than external fixation in these fractures is to go with a good debridement to clean up the wound so as to wash away the infection from the body. So first you clean, wash and debride the wound and then you put in an external fixator. So that's the ideal way for managing the open fractures. Fair enough? Correct. Now this young lady, she was traveling in a car, sitting on the passenger seat in the front and there was an accident. So she developed a deformity. That's visible in this picture. And her relative has clicked that picture. And that's what you know, relatives usually do nowadays. Rather than trying to extend help, they generally click pictures, selfies, pictures, you know, to, to record that moment in their minds, all right? Now she sent you that image on the WhatsApp and she wishes to know the possible injuries. Now looking at this picture, you have to have a diagnosis in your mind. And then you have to tell that all these injuries are possible in this patient except so what is not possible so what is not possible please be very clear so the diagnosis looking at this image okay Kartika says the diagnosis is posterior dislocation of hip okay so what's not possible well, if this is posterior dislocation, what's not possible? Knee ligament injury? Ah, no, 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 no. I would like to go rather with this answer. Femur fracture here. That's not possible with this kind of a deformity. See, 
first of all this is actually a case of hip dislocation a dislocation at the hip tends to be two types you can have an anterior dislocation at hip or at times you can find a posterior dislocation at the hip the two dislocations tend to carry an attitude that is absolutely opposite like see you will observe this hip is in a position of flexion the knee has gone into adduction and the foot has gone into internal rotation so in this particular scenario the head is going to go back but look at the other hip it's in a position of flexion but the knee has rather gone into abduction and this foot has rather gone into external rotation so obviously here this hip is going to go anteriorly so in posterior dislocation of the hip the attitude that a patient carries tends to be farther while in anterior dislocation the attitude that a patient tends to carry tends to be faver flexion abduction external rotation faver flexion adduction internal rotation farther so these are the attitudes you tend to find in the two categories of hip dislocation now not surprisingly 98% of the case scenarios what you find is a posterior dislocation of the hip and i'll tell you because this hip dislocation generally tends to be due to a very very classical pattern of injury that's called a dashboard injury so dashboard injury is what actually leads to these hip dislocations bobby is the voice okay now is the voice part okay all right now dashboard injury i'll just explain to you with this very nice picture you're sitting in the car brakes are put on the dashboard goes and hits your knee your head goes back and you know the moment your head goes back what you get is a posterior dislocation at the hip now it is sometimes possible that the dashboard hits this bone in the front of the knee that is patella so you land up with patella fractures and it remains possible that the dashboard hits the <coughs> tibia pushing it back so this may tear the pcl posterior cruciate ligament injury so these are the components of a dashboard injury okay what you may classically find in people who have met with this accident you know where the dashboard has hit the knee a pcl tear could be there a patella fracture could be there a posterior dislocation of the hip could be there so this is a possibility this is a possibility this is a possibility because if you look at the hip what you have is flexion at the knee what you have is adduction and what you have at the foot is internal rotation so that's why i'm calling it as a case of posterior dislocation of the hip so that means that this is exactly a case who has likely sustained a dashboard injury as he was sitting on this passenger seat in the front so all these things are possible what's likely not possible is a femur fracture well this video will be available for a watch later also dear yeah. the video stay on this platform youtube for long so you can watch it later also don't worry you'll be able to revise it also later fair enough fair enough fair enough so i hope you guys are clear with what are components of dashboard injury you're clear with the attitude you may have in the two types of dislocations the anterior as well as the posterior dislocation that you may have at the hip fair enough fair enough fair enough well perfect now, now emergency part in orthopedics is pretty much full of applying plasters slabs casts because this is what generally you know uh makes up the emergency part now maybe this patient came up with a fracture and he was given this plaster in your emergency now just you know looking at this plaster you have to predict the diagnosis so what you will find you know guys these days that a lot of examiners wish to evaluate your clinical skills whether you have attended your emergencies in your colleges or not so 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 very commonly you know you find these kind of questions where there a real picture is shown to you where some kind of an intervention was done which you don't generally tend to read in books and then you know a question would be asked depending upon that scenario all right so 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 Kamal says it's a scaphoid fracture. Kartika says it's a scaphoid fracture, but Sorob says it's a Coley's fracture. All right. So perhaps people who think it's a scaphoid fracture, I think what's going in their mind 
that this gentleman is holding a glass please know to hold a glass you need this thumb to be mobile the thumb has to be mobile to hold a glass but otherwise trust me with just your fingers it's so difficult to hold a glass guys this is not a glass holding cast in a glass holding cast there will be movements left in the thumb to hold a glass see complete thumb is like covered thumb is not free at all it is totally incorporated in the plaster so this is not really a glass holding cast it's absolutely difficult uh, different it's a thumb spike a cast and thumb spike a cast is given for this issue bennett's fracture got the message so actually here there is a fracture in the first metacarpal bennett is basically a fracture that involves the base of first metacarpal the thumb metacarpal see this is not the glass holding cast in a scaphoid fracture this is that glass holding cast okay and this is what we generally give for scaphoid fractures now i'll just give this gentleman this glass to hold so can you see the tip of the thumb free so that's what you would find in a glass holding cast the thumb tip will be free so that you can hold a glass got the message guys so when you find the complete thumb is incorporated in a plaster you don't call it glass holding you call it thumb spica so there is a metacarpal fracture you find the thumb has been left free that means there is some problem in the wrist likely a scaphoid fracture and cody's fracture you tend to have an absolutely different pattern of a plaster and here it's simply called a hand shaking cast so i hope you guys are now thoroughly clear with some common plaster patterns that we use in orthopedics okay so hand shaking cast you can very well see there's a medial deviation at the wrist there's a flexion at the wrist so what you may have over here will be a palmar flexion plus a medial deviation at the wrist okay but what you are going to have in a glass holding cast would rather be a dorsi flexion at the wrist okay plus what you will have would be rather a lateral deviation at the wrist so these are two absolutely separate movements okay and a glass holding can often be confusing with the thumb spike up but the tip of the thumb that is free or not can easily help you differentiate between these plasters so are you guys clear yes kj only the tip of the thumb will be free in a glass holding plaster the base of the thumb will be incorporated in plasters we generally tend to follow a rule of 2 wherever there is a fracture we go one joint distal one joint proximal so if wrist has a fracture it's enough to immobilize the mcp joint of the thumb the interphalangeal joint of the thumb can be left free but in case the thumb metacarpal has a fracture the interphalangeal joint has to be immobilized so you have to go one joint up in a wrist fracture why go to the tip of the thumb so you can leave the tip of the thumb free if a wrist bone like scaphoid has a fracture clear enough you are right that in aims the sequence was asked so first you give traction in the position of pronation and then you go with first palmar flexion and then eventually you push the wrist into a medial deviation so i hope that query is also sorted you varaj so i have given you the sequence also you know in which a colis plaster is applied so lot of questions on emergency room scenarios so you only know the sequence if you have seen your senior applying a colis plaster so that's the whole idea you know of having these sessions because the inict paper plus the neat pg paper now they are increasingly catching up on these emergency room scenarios to differentiate between the intelligent people and the average people perfect enough wonderful now four year old boy he's come to you with some pain around the elbow the elbow is in position of pronation and extension x ray was done but that's totally normal so what should be the next step of management now this is classically that next type of next pattern type of question you know where you will have integrated questions 
So this question requires a little bit of knowledge of anatomy plus orthopedics. So you have to have a diagnosis in your mind and you have to utilize the fact that it's a young boy, nothing on x-ray, okay, the position of the limb and then you know with the diagnosis you have to decide uh, what the likely answer here would be. So can you guys help me out, you know, with the diagnosis? So, so small child must be crying, so he's been brought to the doctor with this kind of a scenario with this pain around the elbow and the elbow and the you know, forearm that's held in like pronation and extension position. The young boy is not allowing much to fiddle with the elbow. The exercise says it's all normal. So is the child, you know, cranky without a reason? Pulled elbow, full marks, yes, absolutely right. So this is actually a case of pulled elbow and I think enough hints in the question to tell you that it's actually a case of pulled elbow. See, what you tend to find in pulled elbow? There would be a subluxation of the radial head and this head would be subluxating out of the annular ligament, the ligament that surrounds the head. Now please, this classical injury would be seen under the age of 5 years. Because in this particular age, the radial head is unossified. So it's small in size. So with that pulling of that elbow, the head can often, you know, subluxate it out of the angular ligament. Now the head is yet not ossified. So it's not visible on x-rays. Very difficult to find it on x-rays because, because head is still not ossified. So by and large, this is a condition that's just in just a clinical diagnosis in the emergency. So you could very well pick up that classical age and that x-ray that is normal because it cannot pick up that head. So here the classical scenario, the forearm held in this position of pronation and extension is what actually takes you to the diagnosis. And the moment you know from this, that this is pulled elbow, the treatment is just swooping at the forearm. See, in pronation, if the head can subluxate out, in supination it can go back because the head is still unnocified. Even after coming out, the head has not got ossified. So by supination, it will drop back. So just be a little careful. Counsel the parents. Don't pull the elbow too frequently under the sage because the head is unossified. Wait for the sage to go. The head will ossify. It will increase in size. And now by pulling the elbow, it won't come out easily. So only that counseling is required. And all you need to do is supinate the forearm. So I hope that makes now sense to you that this would be the perfect pick. Supinate the forearm. No point of getting the MRI done. MRI in this age group, terrible problem. You have to give anesthesia to the child for nothing. Got the message? So flex and supinate. Absolutely right. And KJ, you are absolutely right. This particular condition is also popular by this name. Nurse maids elbow. So I hope you are clear with all the concepts that surround this little injury. Pulled elbow or what you call as nurse maids elbow. Again, a very, very common question in some of the uh, important exams that you might appear in, like the AIMS, the NEED PG exam. Fairly common, you know, these clinical scenarios, these clinical scenarios, fairly common. So an easy one to end up with. A patient has presented to your hospital and maybe he had a pelvic fracture and this was sustained three days back. Now in emergency, you would try resuscitating these people, but not always would you be successful. So the patient was dysnic on the presentation, okay. You tried resuscitation, but the patient died, despite your resuscitation efforts. Not uncommon. So you have to tell me the likely cause of death. The wonderful Yuvraj, you answered it three times to ensure that other people also listen to you. Well, 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 guys, let me tell you, Raj was correct, I think. He was pretty much sure about the answer here. Yes, you're absolutely right, Raj. Fat embolism is the scenario that closely, mo most closely matches this particular case. See, pelvic fracture is like something that, you know, we generally associate with heavy bleeding. In pelvic fracture, if you're going to ask me about the blood loss, 
I would say this goes to approximately like 1.522 liters. Now that's a heavy bit of blood loss, you know, because because the average blood volume, uh, the average blood volume, the average blood volume. Uh, guys, what is our average blood volume? Like, like orthopedic surgeons little meager with their knowledge, limited knowledge. So can you guys help me out? Like, what is the average amount of blood in our body? Yes, yes, yes. Kartika, Yuvraj, Bobby, Sagar. Four to five liters. Five liters. Yes, I'll give it to you guys. Five liters. So five liters. So this is all American research, European research. Think about the Indians. Four liters. Four liters. Lower range. Four liters. And think about the doctor. Three liters. Three liters. Sab log khun pi jate hai, doctor ka. Three liters. So three liters of blood in body. One point five liters gone. Pelvic fracture. So I hope you put my message. So the loss may be like almost 40% of the blood volume. So there's a heavy amount of blood loss. So so this person can collapse. So hemorrhage could be an important cause of death in these people. But this will be during the first two days, one or two days. See, after three days, extra medullary hematopoiesis will happen. Bone marrow will start forming bloods. You would have given fluids. So bleeding would generally not kill after second day. The first two days will be crucial from this respect that that bleeding might have been the cause of death. Fat embolism becomes important between this time three to seven days of injury. So that's the scenario where fat embolism has to be kept in mind between three to seven days of injury. Pulmonary embolism, well, I'll tell you. When you are sedentary for more than seven days, like you're lying on the bed for more than seven days because no doctor has treated you, the leg veins will develop clots. So what the patient would land up will be deep vein thrombosis, DVT, as you guys better call it. Now these clots would embol, embol, you know, embolize and block the pulmonary vasculature leading to pulmonary embolism. So pulmonary embolism is generally a delayed complication occurring beyond a week and may it be pulmonary embolism, may it be fat embolism, they are eventually going to block the pulmonary vasculature leading to respiratory distress. So this is the end point of both the embolisms. So what has been asked over here is the most likely cause of death in this duration, so this becomes the best pick, fat embolism. So I hope you are clear with all these terminologies. You understood which condition would kill you when. You are clear with these scenarios. Okay, clear with these scenarios. All that you brought. So you attended your free class on an academy. Fan of mine. Well, thank you. I am obliged to hear such a nice, you know, encouraging feedback from you. And your feedback keeps me going. So so I'll, I'll keep pushing myself to give you even better. Okay. And yes. Uh, before I end up, just a little bit about, you know, this particular problem, fat embolism syndrome. See, fat embolism syndrome, you've understood. You have to think about it between this duration, 3 to 7 days of injury. Fat embolism syndrome, a classical clinical hallmark, tends to be the presence of auxiliary and subconjunctival pitiki in these people so when you see this pitiki in these people with respiratory distress that just clinches the diagnosis of fat embolism syndrome well why these pitiki because because of some unknown reason these people tend to land up with thrombocytopenia i am sure you might have heard of something called a GERDS criteria a part of GERD's criteria are these PTK and thrombocytopenia. So with this criteria, you actually make the formal diagnosis of fat embolism syndrome. But GERD's criteria is basically, you know, based upon several factors like oxygen saturation, presence of respiratory distress, respiratory rate, thrombocytopenia, PTK, multiple things. But the most important component are these PTK. You see these auxiliary subconjunctival PTK, you can be very much sure this is fat embolism syndrome. Just in case you guys are going to ask me, the first laboratory marker that tells you that this is fat embolism syndrome, I'm going to say lipuria, finding fat in the urine. So that is the first laboratory marker. And the moment you know this is fat embolism syndrome, the treatment, 
it's largely supportive you put this person on an oxygen support system like a ventilator like you do in covid give oxygen you wait for these 7 days to go the fat dissolves it dislodges and the syndrome improves but identification of the syndrome by these methods is very important so that you can channel the right form of treatment and counsel the family and the patient so i hope you are clear with all these things yes one major four major minor criteria in gerd's criteria but i don't think full criteria is that important for you knowing what is there in the criteria would be good enough you guys okay so 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 i hope you enjoyed the session for today i'm done with it i'm done with it i'm done with it okay so there there's a test being shown over here quickly so we have just i think two three more minutes i think we can just quickly go with this one last one before i wrap up so there's a test being shown over here okay so this patient had sciatica so this test is being shown over here so quickly let me know what is this test in the question so i hardly have five more minutes left guys so please let's not waste even a pinch of the a time we have so one last question and maybe then i can wrap up okay so please please quickly can you help me know what test is being performed here yes yes c lasik sign so this is lasik sign yes any more people who wish to enter into the okay b b b passive slatty passive slatty no it's lasik sign that's the answer see active slrt means when the patient lifts the leg active slrt is basically for a fracture of neck of femur there's a fracture of neck of femur like generally a kind of a stress fracture the patient would not be able to lift the leg by himself that is active slrt and this is nothing to do with the fracture head at the back of the thigh you have that sciatic nerve So when you are going to lift up the thigh, the nerve at the back will be pulled. You know, the sciatic nerve is going at the back. So these problems tend to injure the, you know, uh, tend to irritate the sciatic nerve. So lifting the leg becomes painful in these people of sciatic ah. So what we do over here is passive SLRT. The doctor will lift the leg, and this nerve will be stretched, and there will be pain. The problem with a passive SLRT are hip joint pathologies. if there is hip joint pathology you can have false results see you are moving the hip by flexing to stretch the nerve so hip joint pathologies can also cause pain in a passive slrt so in order to improve the passive slrt you know so this is that passive slrt where you simply lift the leg like this to stretch the nerve so in order to improve this there are modifications that have been designed like lasik's modification or bragard's modification so see what is being doing done here lasik you have lifted up the thigh okay to generate the pain now you flex the leg you flex the knee so the nerve will be relaxed because that is how this nerve is going so this is relaxing the nerve so you bring the leg down the pain goes away it is nerve pain because the pain from the hip will persist because the hip flexion is still maintained so you have lifted there is pain it could be a nerve problem it could be a hip joint problem you bring the leg down pain gone it's definitely a nerve problem or if you don't want to bring the leg down to relax the nerve you can also you know stretch the ankle or dorsiflex the ankle you dorsiflex the ankle the nerve will be stretched pain increases you uh, plantar flex the ankle the pain the nerve is relaxed the pain goes down so you can use that knee or ankle you know movements to relax the nerve to ensure this is nerve pain the hip flexion is remained static so i hope you got my message okay guys so you got my message that these are modifications of a passive slrt to ensure you are dealing with the nerve pain and it's not a hip pain so are you guys clear with this so paul kamal yuvraj you guys are all clear what is the relevance behind a lasik test how is it better than the uh, the passive slrt that is routinely done in cases of sciatica so i hope you understand what is meant by slrt straight leg raising test so can i have that last thumbs up guys before i can wrap up the session fair enough fair enough fair enough so that's all that's all that's all from my side hope you enjoyed the classes you wish to attend more classes please subscribe to this wonderful platform an academy lots 
more there for you so you we have the achievers batch coming up for the people getting up for NEP 2023 just started November 21 so you can just quickly enroll yourself to make sure you miss nothing you are in the early part of your career prof 2 students please make sure that you start preparing for the exams even only now only so you can attach yourself to an academy and uh, you will have really good packages coming your way okay so if you subscribe and please please people who are getting up for the exam make sure you don't miss these mcq exams you know the test that we are conducting on the academy a lot of good prizes to be won so that's all from my side so hope you enjoyed the lecture this is a telegram group i run t.me dr mukul ortho so any doubts you have after the class you can connect to me on this group just in case you wish to subscribe and you wish to avail a discount this is the referral code ortho live you can use and you can fetch your 10 percent off a gift from my side wish you all the best guys good night for today hope you enjoyed the session bye bye so thank you for the lovely comments guys packing up packing up yeah thank you bye bye good night